A very warm welcome to this last episode of The Grounded Conductor with me, Timothy Henty, for At Home with LMP. And this week we're talking about great conductors, but specifically what makes a conductor great? That's a pretty big question. And so for this, I decided I need a co-host. And I'm delighted to welcome all the way from Brazil, my very good friend and former professor, Neil Thompson, Principal Conductor of the Orchestra Philharmonica de Goiás. Neil, hello there. How are you? Hello, Tim. Nice to see you. Nice to see you too. So we're talking about what makes a conductor great. Prologue-like, uh, a few exceptions here. We're not giving a list of our favourite great conductors because that would just serve not really the purpose we're after. And also uh, we'd leave out your favourite conductors as well. We're also not talking about comparison of repertoire or interpretation. That's Interpretation is a fantastic conversation perhaps for another episode. No, we're talking about the person itself and the qualities that those people have. So Neil, if I may, what makes a conductor great? Wow, big question. Um, when I th look at the great conductors, they all have three or four things in common. The first thing, and the most important thing for me, for me is, is, is a mastery, a complete mastery of the score. Um, the ability to illuminate a work. Um, the ability to draw the best possible playing out of an orchestra. The ability to convince an orchestra of your vision of the piece. And through that, to, be, to, to transmit this to the audience in a way that will leave them changed after hearing it. Well, we have some ex extraordinary guests on this last episode of The Grounded Conductor, and we spoke to them about their personal experiences of working with conductors that have really affected their lives. I, well, uh, head and shoulders, I think. Or, well, not exactly. Yes, head and shoulders, perhaps, in, in, a, in a certain way. Uh, Above, uh, above so many of the others would be uh, Savalish, Wolfgang Savalish. Um, and uh, we worked together mostly in Munich, but traveling as well in various other places uh, for concerts and, and op op opera mostly. Uh, but I, I developed um, a tremendous respect for him. I mean, I just, more than respect. I loved his music and the way that he made music. He was a consummate uh, a musician and uh, holder of so many uh, natural instincts somehow in, in, in how to make music work. He, he, he was just a Mr. Music, if you like, and, and uh, it, it, someone in whom you could put an immense amount of trust. Well, one that I had a lot of a lot of time for, um, also known as the Screaming Skull, with some orchestras who didn't like him quite so much, was Sir George Shorty. Um, he used to use my orchestra, his sort of rehearsal orchestra, for the Chicago Symphony or anything a big occasion of a piece he'd not done before. Um, we loved having him up in Manchester, and he was due to conduct the Mozart Requiem on the exact 200th anniversary of Mozart's death in St. Stephen's Cathedral in Vienna. And he'd never conducted it before. It was amazing. In fact, he was almost 80 at this time, never ever conducted the Mozart record. And we did two performances. And the thing that really knocked me out was the fact that the next morning at sort of eight, nine o'clock in the morning, he insisted on coming to hear exactly what he'd been doing on the night before. And it just shows what a professional, a real professional he was, even at that age. Um, let me talk a, a little bit about uh, working with Sir Mark Eldar. I've built up a, a, a working relationship with him over uh, many years. And again, he's a conductor who has really uh, um, supported me in my singing and more recently in some of the writing I've, do, uh, I've done the arrangements. Um, and it's always a huge compliment for me to work with someone of, 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 um, of a, who's so much my senior in so many ways, 
th there is a compliment that he gives me just by taking an interest in what I do. That it is, um, it, it, it builds me up and again helps me to do my best. And the thing about Sir Mark being having having been such a powerhouse of, of E and O in the past, and then gone on to, to orchestras around the world, and his particular relationship with the Halle, um, he has shown that he he invests in musicians. The Halle is an obvious example, but it, it it spreads much wider than that. And I feel therefore he's invested in, in me to some extent, and that's a, a, say a huge compliment. Um, and with, with working with, with Sir Mark, there is this wisdom that he has. So here's something again for, for conductors. Um, we have this feeling that for a conductor to be great, to be considered great, he or she must be old um, because there is a life experience that they must bring with them in order to make them, to give them access to greatness. Now, I'm sure that can be tested as a theory, but on the other hand, someone like Sir Mark does just have a great deal of wisdom, of, 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 of experience of, of conducting different orchestras in the same repertoire and, 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 and also a huge repertoire so that um, they, they've worked out what they're really great at what they really love. They've also worked out what interests them less, so they don't need to do that anymore. And they've also worked out time and time again um, a, a, an approach to a piece, whether it's a Beethoven symphony or whatever, something very specific, that, they, that they've worked out the quickest way for them to get what they want is to do this with it, with an orchestra, or, or get something out of a singer who's looking a bit, um, a bit uncomfortable, a bit nervous. And the quickest way is just to cut all the rubbish and just get straight to the point to enable that singer to, 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 to work. Um, and so that, I think, is what age, wisdom and experience means. I suppose when I went to the London Philharmonic, I did that first 12 years um, with Heiting, that entire tenure of him with the London Philharmonic. So I became... I suppose we played and recorded most of the literature during that time and I got to know him very, very, very well and we became close colleagues during that time and we had a good morale in the orchestra and because of, the, because of all of the visiting conductors who were attracted to the London Philharmonic at that time then I suppose we kind of were the fashionable crowd. Before that, I had been, I had been for a year and a half co-concert master, and I was only 21 years old at that time, so I didn't know very much. But I, I was co-concert -co -co master of the London Symphony. And uh, at that time, the principal conductor was Monteur, who of course did the first um, performance of the Rite of Spring, Stravinsky. Mm -hmm. And so when we rehearsed that, I mean, Stravinsky was present and he was kind of sitting in the chair between myself and, and Monteur. So we were getting the Rite of Spring absolutely so wonderfully clear and so expressive and so on. This, these, these are moments of, were, were of great joy, joy for me. Um, there were many moments like that. Um, working with, for example, recording the War Requiem with Benjamin Britten, yeah. conducting, who, who was conducting. Um, lots of composers that I did work with during that period as well. But as purely as conductor, um, I think that the first one who I'm working with absolutely very, very intimately was Haiti. And so, you know, we recorded many, many pieces during that time because that was a very, very, very strong recording period. I mean, I remember in the first year, two years, we were doing something like 150 sessions a year, which is kind of almost totally unheard of today. Mm -hmm. So we were getting through so much literature all of Shostakovich, all of Beethoven, all of Brahms, and so on. Yeah. And 
Of course, I, during that period, I was having a great time, a lot, 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 wonderful time with, with people like Adrian Bolt and so on, um, where we, who we recorded all the English music with, most of, of Vaughan Williams and Devious and so on and so on. But um, Bolt, I think, was somebody who I loved a lot. And, and, and but hiking, th this was kind of a, a, a different kind of um, working relationship and a musical one too. So. In that top few that I really admire and, and really felt great reward from is Bernard Hiding. Um, he, I didn't work with him very, very often uh, because he was mostly London Philharmonic Orchestra and he had a position with them, of course. But he did a couple of appearances with the Philharmonia. Um, it, it, uh, strangely, he did a, a, we did a record of the six uh, Pomp and Circumstance marches as a Velgar. I have no idea why, um, but um, we did those and uh, they were a great success. But the piece I remember him doing um, and me enjoying, but partly because I think it's one of the greatest symphonies ever written, was Walton's first symphony. Uh, I've known it as a schoolboy, actually, a, 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 a school colleague had told me about it. And, I couldn't believe it. I still think it's one of the most exciting works ever written by anyone at any time. Um, anyway, he came along, uh, we did it in the MI, um, and it's it's a lovely, lovely recording. It's very warm, uh, as, as just about everything he does is very warm. It's very, I don't mean this in a bad way, it's very amenable and, and it makes you love the sound it makes. And I think that if, if there was one outstanding quality of, of, of Heitings, it's making the orchestra sound good and wholesome and warm and, and, and comforting in a way, but that maybe it's not the wrong, right word, but very much a kind of a, a, an inclusive sound from the orchestra. And I think he did great things with the LPO, there's no doubt about that. And we certainly felt that in the Philharmonia when, uh, when he did these pieces with us. Fantastic insight there from our guests. Neil, when it comes to great conductors, does technique matter? I would say the answer, perhaps rather unhelpfully, is yes and no, because there are very great conductors who have what might be described as, I suppose, unorthodox techniques, who get fantastic results from, from orchestras. And then you have people like Heitink, Boulez, Adrian Bolt, Bernstein, who have wonderful techniques. Um, I think it, it certainly helps from an orchestral musician's point of view. Um, it, it enables the conductor to get straight to the music and not to, to worry about any sort of technical issues, things not being together because they can't read the conductor. Um, and if you look at someone like Bernard Heitink, someone once said about him that he has this, it's a very rare ability to make things go right before they've gone wrong. Um, and I think that's something that all conductors should aspire to. His beat is so simple, it's so distilled. It's impossible not to play the way he wants. I've seen him taking a, a, a new orchestra and within half an hour it sounds like the old Concertgebouw. You know, he somehow grafted his sound onto the orchestra. Someone like Adrian Bolt had a, a very distinctive technique. Uh, everything at the point of the stick, this enormous baton very little body movement but absolute masterly control he could show a lot of detail and he always gave the musicians the, the sense of freedom to play so that yet again nothing getting in the way of the music Pierre Boulez I mean it, it goes without saying a, a masterful technique but supremely simple nothing to get in the way of the music nothing to get in the way of the musicians giving their best in the music Bernstein was, was, was slightly different in that he was, a, he was the sort of conductor who could show everything. He, I mean, every little change of, of character, of emotion, of, of phrasing, of, of, of rhythm, everything was there. But he used his whole body, his face, his hands, uh, and everything. If technique is about showing music to an orchestra, then Bernstein, of course, was a master. Well, Bolt was, of course, very much from the old school. I mean, he, he was not... A great rehearser, you know. He, he he but he was a great musician, and he, he could bend music in all directions. I mean, he it was always. I don't know whether uh, 
you are aware of, of, of a book that he wrote called The Point of the Stake, which, because his baton was in no, enormous length. It was about, you know, I, I think probably like two and a half foot in length. But, if it, but that, that stick was unbelievable because the hand, the hand movement was very small, but the stick, the end of the stick, the movement actually was very, very wide. And he studied, I think, with Nikish. Well, I'm sure he did. And so, I, I mean, he, he had a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful feeling for, for music. And, and it worked incredibly with orchestras because, because his gestures were so simple and yet so effective. There was none of the, this jabbing at players and, and promoting one's technique as I, I experienced many times in my career. But so the music, uh, you, you could see in the eyes, you could see in the hands, you could feel that the, there was unity, both musically and I, so, I suppose there was a little bit of the greatest ingredient of, of English temperament that you could ever find. I'd always admired Boulez, and we did some work with him, and he absolutely lived up and exceeded my expectations. Completely charming. Um, and uh, I'd heard all sorts of stories from colleagues in the BBC Symphony Orchestra. I always found him utterly charming, um, very reasonable, actually, uh, very demanding. He wanted his music played correctly, but he was not without uh, understanding about the difficulties of being a player, um, and he knew that certain things were extremely difficult. I think he was always glad and grateful even when players were seen to uh, want to make it better and to be interested in making it better and uh, part of the process of making it better. So I, I thought he was wonderful. Uh, he just came in and did some guest appearances and I, I thought he was absolutely delightful. Utterly clear, of course. There is no clearer conductor in, in so many ways. Um, who, somebody like Leonard Bernstein, who was very, very much a very, arguably for me, the greatest of all conductors, because his, he was, I mean, he was just so kind and he was so generous in his music making. And, and every, every eye movement, every physical movement was, was, had got an ingredient of, okay, this is fine, we're with a master. And so we're safe. Because, I mean, at that time, those orchestras, I mean, pound for pound, were first class instrumentalists. They didn't really need somebody to beat time for them. They needed to, to, to understand what the musical intent was. A lot of things I, I, with Bernard, particularly the big, big, massive pieces. I mean, because he had such strength as a young man. The, um, when he went, I mean, to, to play a Mahler symphony or a Bruckner with him. I mean, then of course we did all of everything many times. He went on tour with them. And this was very powerful. Mm. This was a Oh, this was a, a tour de force, really. And his, his strength, his physical strength, combined with his mental knowledge, was something that was... It was tiring. It, he was, it was a real tour de force in all respects, wasn't he? Um, did, was he, uh, for that point of view, perhaps even sometimes frustrating to work with? Or... Um, mm stressful to work with or did you always feel that there was a, a level of trust there there was a massive level of trust and i never ever found any 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 stress whatsoever i could i can hand on heart i can say that i um even even if i if if i even if i would suggest something for the strings or something he would always trust that we were dealing with the situation because it's not, it was not a selfish thing. It was like doing a quartet or a quintet or a, it was, it was that, okay, you, that's, that's your area. You know, you know, it's, it's a dam or an up or it's off the spring, it's on the spring, whatever. He trusted the players 
and we trusted each other. It's, it's, I, th I don't know how far away from this kind of mentality we, the orchestra have moved, but certainly in my day, the, 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 it was a great, great joy to play, actually, this literature with those people. It was. Yes. Mm. Neil, the musicians we're talking about here are incredibly sophisticated here, but um, their approach is often quite direct, would you agree? Yes, I mean, it's sort of uh, disarmingly simple in their approach, masking the, the sophistication of the music making. I mean, if you look at someone like Giulini, he, he didn't talk so much in rehearsal, he let the orchestra play. Um, but he had a way of eliciting exactly what he wanted. The musicians were absolutely in no doubt whatsoever what he wanted. And that's, that's, the, that's the quality of a, of a great conductor. Both he and Charles McCarris, and McCarris is, uh, is a wonderful conductor who I admire immensely, they both provided their own material, which was meticulously marked. And McCarris always said that allows you to get straight to the music, you know, when you're not stopping every three bars and adding dynamics or changing bowings. So I think that's, you know, that yet again was very practical, very, very, very simple. And someone like Wolfgang Sabalisch, I mean, a, a very discreet person. Um, and his music making was, was gloriously natural. Nothing with any artifice, nothing forced. His style of conducting was, was very clear and very simple. Well, we're talking about working with uh, Wolfgang Savalich, and my work with him was largely in opera, and uh, refining it even further, it was many, many performances of Don Giovanni, um, mostly in uh, mostly in Munich, sometimes in Japan, memorably in Japan. Uh, well, I say memorably in Japan. A, a lot of things that I associate with uh, Savalich and uh, are. are, are have a memorable quality to them. I mean, for example, when I say memorably in Japan, he was there with his wife, Mechtilt. We were all in the same, um, uh, same uh, massive hotel, though probably on different floors. Uh, uh, and we got to talking one day. I bumped into him in a, in a local supermarket where my wife and I were shopping and buying our usual sushi for the day, whatever it might be. And I said, Maestro, you must, um, you, you, I know you've been here uh, on many occasions. You must en enjoy all of this, uh, the, the, the cuisine and everything else. I read. And he said, no, I have never eaten Japanese food. And, uh, and he was wandering around looking at this stuff, but he wouldn't dream of eating it. And, uh, unusual for the man that he was. I mean, he was so, uh, such an aesthete in a way, uh, or ascetic, I don't know, he, there, there was something very, um, he, was, he was educated at, uh, in a Jesuit school um, and had a, a kind of Jesuit, Jesuitical quality about him in a way. It was, it was very, very refined. I mean, it was always the white shirt, always tie, and incredibly under control. And yet, he would go regularly to Japan. He would, uh, I think, make a journey from Munich, his home, to Los Angeles, do some concerts in either Los Angeles or San Francisco, probably. And then, uh, then make his way further to Japan. But he'd stop off in Honolulu. The idea of Savalish enjoying time in Honolulu is something that I can't get my head around even now. And then he would make his way to Japan, where he was adored. He was a godlike figure, as, as conductors go, in Japan. And uh, con conducted on over a period of 30, 30 odd years, 40 years, maybe something like that, on a regular, regular basis. So it was really extraordinary. But th there, was a, there was a discipline, there was a sti stiffness, I suppose, in a way about him. But Whatever it was, that stiffness, somehow he was able to allow music to flow from himself. I mean, I remember performances with um, Giulini and other people, even, I don't know whether you remember that perhaps before your, long time before your time, somebody called Joseph Cripps, who was the uh, conductor of the Vienna Philharmonic. He was a master musician. I mean, he, he used Strauss and he, and so when we did Strauss with him, there's also, 
It was a little bit like watching the films of Strauss. His, the, the gestures and, and what were not important, the music was everything. And so he got, he got extraordinary results. Giulini was another one who, who um, intrigued me. I mean, he was, he was film star-like. Uh, and I felt, and I did get to know him, and I felt that he probably lived on fruit and chopped nuts. Um, he was, he was an, um, an aesthetic uh, sort of man, right, right, right through him. But the funny thing was, when I first sang with him, having you know been this complete, and I was completely in love with this bloke. Uh, we did Das Paradisum di Peri of Schumann at the Edinburgh Festival in 1973. Uh, and I was thrilled to bits to be there with him. And uh, he confused me because I saw this elegant man where, where Byrne or Heiting, you know, relatively smaller men would do these neat little gestures. There was this very elegant man conducting most inelegantly. Um, when he wanted to make uh, the, the, convention, the conventional battle and everything else, but when he wanted to make uh, a brutal gesture, something that was really uh, forceful, he would take the baton and hold it like, um, like a dagger almost. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah. I've, I've got a pencil there. So he would be kind of like so. And then it, suddenly he would grab the baton and uh, uh, take to make his effects. And it looked so ill-fitting on him otherwise. You were looking at this, um, this godlike figure being uh, devilish with, with the baton. But he, I suppose he made his effect. I suppose, no, I don't suppose, I know uh, if there's one conductor who, for me, was the ultimate conductor in, in just about every way I can possibly imagine, it's Charles Vaqueros, Sir Charles Vaqueros. Um, he, he undoubtedly didn't have the suavity or the charm or the smooth practice technique of so many other conductors, but he had knowledge, he had enormous humility, actually, um, uh, uh, and a great kind of awareness of style. He had an enormous repertoire, let's face it. I, I played Bach with him, I played Handel with him, I played Mozart with him, and not to mention Janacek. I went to see his uh, uh, production or his, his uh, performance of uh, Meistersinger at uh, the Colosseum. Wonderful, wonderful man. Um, a, a, a person of great humor actually, but certainly great knowledge. Um, and, and he sums up for me what I like from a conductor, which is not all the suave uh, and practice movements that you get. I, you know, with great respect to so many young and very talented young conductors now who've been to the teachers in, 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 in Russia and in Finland and in the UK and everywhere in the world. And they've got these wonderful movements. And I'm, I'm there in awe. I mean, I wish I could do movements like that. They're so clever and they're so discreet in what they do. But what I want from a conductor is some feeling that I, I, I will follow you, you know, in whichever corner of whichever bar, in whichever piece of music you want. Um, and and I think for me, Charles McCarris was that, uh, and and I think all conductors would do well to uh, follow his example. I was very fortunate. I I, I was general manager in, in in Liverpool at the Philharmonic there, and my office was the was actually the conductor's room as well. So it was a wonderful way to get to know all these conductors. I remember Gergiev coming for the first time to the UK and, and really getting to know him. Uh, uh, but one was Sir Charles McCarris, who, who had a fund of stories, a great experience of, uh, especially obviously doing the Yanacek. But, but again, even when we were recording, we were, made a record of Rachmaninoff's third symphony and the symphonic dances. And in the way that he'd go back to, to, to authentic music for older, older style Handel and things like that, he was very much into that. He spent hours researching these pieces, going back to Rachmaninoff 
uh, the way where all the slides would come in. He went to the, the third, the symphonic dancers, and discovered on the first recording, which all men made in Philadelphia, there was extra piano parts, which aren't in the score. Mm. And we had those transcribed, and those were on the discs as well. And it was this fanaticism, recording Mahler's symphonies. He, he would research to the last detail of whether it should be the second violins or the violas on the right hand side. And that's, that's for somebody who also has the musicianship is something that I really respect because there are so many conductors that come in. I, I, I won't mention any names, but they're learning it on the rostrum. I've seen conductors sit on the rostrum halfway through a rehearsal, turning the score as though they've never seen it before. And there are a lot about like that, and I don't respect that. Neil, people often talk about conductors needing great personality and charisma. Is it always important to be an extrovert on the podium, or are there more than one way of dealing with these things? I think for sure, charisma and personality are hugely important, but I think people manifest it in, in, in different ways. I mean, if you look at someone like Heitink, who is a very shy person, or Sabalish, also a very discreet person, they have the personality to convince musicians of their vision. And at the other end of the spectrum, you have super extroverts like Schulte and Bernstein, who, you know, uh, it, I remember Schulte walking into, into the rehearsal hall at the academy, and it was, you know, you felt the electricity of the man's presence. So there, 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 there are different ways of doing it. Sometimes I think that, you know, chariz, charisma is, is an overrated um, quality because what they all have ultimately is a, a profound self-confidence about music. And I think that's, that's, the mo that's the most important thing. You would be right in saying that Charlton has come up in my career. Yes, I... I... Uh, worked with him quite early on. I think we recorded, I had a small role in Carmen, but uh, the main thing that I did with him undoubtedly was a, was a memorable Figaro, the marriage of Figaro uh, with the London Philharmonic, which we recorded at Kingsway Hall. Uh, I was the count and it was a cast that had Kiriti Kanawa and Lucy Pop and Sam Raimi and Kurt Moll as Dr. Bartolo. I mean, it was a, it was a it was a ritzy cast, if ever there was one. It was just, uh, it was terrific. It was a, in a, he knew his way inside out in that piece. I do remember one thing about him, what he, he could do. He had a fantastic, phenomenal computer like memory for Tempe. And we ran short of time at the end of the uh, allotted uh, period to record the entire opera. And he hadn't done the overture. So he said, let's just, put something down to the office, oh, let's put something down, yes, yes, let's put something down, or whatever it was, with a towel around his neck. And uh, so he put the first two or three bars, put them down with the orchestra. Months went by, and he had the further sessions with the London Philharmonic, and he went into the studio and said, let's finish Figaro. Absolutely spot on. It was like a, you know, machine, complete machine. There are three or four images that I have of them, one of him. One of them is certainly his uh, appearances in the culture of film, because I, I was sort of around and being a staff, I forget when exactly when that was, but I was just at the early days of my being a student, so it was of great interest to me, mainly because of Birgit Nielsen to listen to this phenomenal voice, and Fischer Dieskau was the Gunther in, uh, in the Goethe Demerum, I think. So I was listening to that and watching this man. Um, and, but as a student, um, it's funny, you've, you've mentioned two people, and one of them uh, comes into the picture. I wasn't sure whether he was going to, but Adrian Bolt, Sir Adrian Bolt, was conductor and leader of the first orchestra at the college. Not leader, that's, a, that's the wrong title in this country. But he was conductor... Uh, uh, of, of the first orchestra at college. And of course, he was in his career, the latter part of his career at the time, but whenever he was free, he would be there for that. Occasionally, he would not be able to make um, a date. And someone else, often uh, Vernon Handley, would stand in for him. 
and Vernon had the same principle of a, the, the rubber band wrapped around a very long uh, baton that almost curved like a trout rod at the end of it, it was so long. Uh, but there was one occasion when, they, when Vernon wasn't available and they asked around and who was available, George Schulte. So Schulte came in, this was probably not long after he took over at Cotton Garden, I forget the date exactly now. But it must have been about 64, 65. Schulte came in to take first orchestra. Well, when Bolt arrived, it was in a, this very tall, austere man from the First World War, uh, would walk down uh, with suit and tie and everything else. When Schulte came in, it was this shambling figure in a, in a polo t-shirt, rather, rather like the one I've got on at the moment, a red towel around his neck, and he got up onto the platform, and it was like, it was like zoo time. I mean, it was a wild animal as opposed to this cultivated Englishman, Sir Adrian Bolt, that had been the leader of them. In, in, they didn't know what had hit them. They really didn't know what had hit them. And he gave them the full works. You know, he took them as though they were a fully professional orchestra and worked at them, uh, which is right, which is, ha which is what it has to be. But it was a shock to the system. It was a shock for everybody, I think having him around. The other image that is in my mind is a photograph. And I, you know, one of a certain amount about the man, but not, not everything. And then you see a photograph of uh, Munich in late 30s, early 40s, whatever, or middle 40s, whatever it is. And there is Richard Strauss, and there is Schulte alongside him, you know, and uh, you think, my God, this, this, this connection. And I, up to that point, I'd always thought of Strauss as being a small man. You have impressions of people being small or tall. Well, Strauss, of course, was a very tall man. And alongside him was the, this um, Alberich figure um, of George Schulte. And, uh, and, and then there was that manic behavior that, that I, my own teacher worked with him years and years and years ago. I, I want to say at Glyndebourne, but I'm not sure. He may have turned up at Glyndebourne in the early part of his life. And he wanted my, my teacher to give more rhythm to the phrases he was singing. And he said, it needs to be and he gripped him by the hand, emphasizing this rhythm that he needed. And when he took his hand away, my teacher was bleeding bleeding from the hand. I mean, the nails of his hand, his fingers are dug in, so that's how intense he was. Uh, music making, I don't know. I, I got involved, uh, I think we did a Brahms Requiem on one occasion that was hyperactive. And it was rolling shoulders, it was the whole thing. It was like someone watching someone doing aerobics, you know. Uh, and I found that with, with, with the, technique of, the technique of conducting, the actual arm movement and everything else varies so much from one to another, the, the way that effect is made. Simon Rattle is a conductor. I've looked up to it ever since I w w was a, a boy owning records. I got one or two records of his that are, that are so thick you can actually treat them like a CD. So that's how old they are. And I had no concept at that age that I might one day work with him. So it's, kind of, it's, it's real pedals, pedestal stuff here to, to come around to a position where I might actually uh, be working with him. And this came to me because the, uh, when Peter Sellers was doing a staged version of the Bach John Passion, this must be about 2016-ish, give or take a couple of years either direction. Uh, Thomas Christopher just announced his retirement very suddenly and they needed someone to, to sing Christus and I, and I was there for that. It's a great bit of timing. Now, I have to say it was the most extraordinary experience for me on so many levels, but I cannot claim to have been conducted by Simon Rattle or Sir Simon to me, uh, Rattle, because I was singing uh, Restative, which was unconducted, and I was blindfolded blindfolded for most of the show. So I can tell you what it's like to be at Simon Rattle's feet listening to him conduct, blindfolded, in, uh, well I was but not him, <laughs> uh, and to be, I was intensely aware of his presence 
because I could hear his feet near my head when I was lying on the floor. Being a semi-stage thing, Chris just spends most of his time in, 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 in torture. Um, and I could hear him breathe, and of course I could hear him in rehearsals the way he guided the, um, the, the Berlin Philharmonic and the, and the radio chorus, um, it, half in English, half in German. And, and it's very interesting to hear him galvanize. Now that, for me, is one of, his, one of the most electric things in the room, was to hear him um, galvanize. A lot of his talking he does with his hands, and even blindfold, I can tell that. So he doesn't necessarily, in the rehearsals, talk too much about what he wants musically. M maybe one or two very clear points that, that he needs to change. He, rather than talk about it too much, he wants to change one or two things, gets them done. But it's, it's the way that he, he leads through charisma, which I think is, is impressive. And he, he's very, he's, he, he's a, when you consider it, he's very clever at this. He's instinctively clever at this, that he knows when he comes into a room, the temperature changes. Uh, there's a respect and, and people listen to him. Um, and he knows he doesn't need to say too much to make things happen. Um, and he's able to use that. He's able to choose his words carefully so that they hit home in whichever language he, he needs. And, um, uh, and then things are tight, and then he makes music, and he's got everybody on side. It, that, was, that was amazing to see. I then did, I then was under his baton in the, um, we did the prom following uh, a few years later, uh, singing Ger Dream of Gerontius with the Vieta Philharmonic. And that, again, was an extraordinary experience. Uh, the sharing of respect, so, you know, I'm sitting there thinking, this is the Vienna Philharmonic around me here. I was sitting right in the, in the middle of the string sections and they are playing Elgar. It's just amazing. And they're playing Elgar with Sir Simon Rattle conducting them. And you can see it's a, it's a massive love in, everybody giving on their very best, but offering it up to each other. So this is what I mean about, uh, about galvanizing. It's, the, it's, it's as though Simon Rattle is enabling people to do their very best. There's nothing in him, it seems to me, getting in the way of, of, of people doing their best. He's not putting people on the spot, it feels to me, in the rehearsals I witnessed. Um, and I also sort of say one other Simon Rattle memory, and that's of being, uh, taking me back to being a teenager again and watching a prom on the television. And the camera must be in the middle of the woodwind section somewhere because um, Simon gave a cue straight into the camera. And sitting at home, I, <laughs> I sort of flinched. Oh my God, his, his, his cueing was so direct. And though that, that open mouth, wide eyed thing, he's saying, yes, yes, you do your thing now. And I was on the sofa at home going, yes. <laughs> yeah, anyway, that, that, that is as much as being conducted by Simon as I can remember. It's very, oh, very personal. <laughs> the best thing, I think, one of the best things I've heard uh, was working with young, that young whippersnapper, Simon Rattle, some years ago. Um, and uh, we, I forget what it was. It might have been Cosi Van Tutti or something like that. Uh, there were, there were lots of things and to be able to stop in the middle of whatever it is you're doing say oh bloody hell sorry about that i made an absolute cock up of that let's do that again um there are quite a number of eminent names i know would never use those words in that situation i think to be able to do that is a measure of a considerable uh, person and a considerable uh, person in that particular position. Uh, it, it's, um, it would appear not to be easy, but it's the, it requires belief. It requires, it's, it's, it's the, uh, goes without saying, you need confidence in yourself to be able to take that stance rather than squirm yourself, squirm your way out of it by some kind of excuse or other in the way of a Dominic Cummings um uh, so to, to, i admire that in in somebody like a rattle or or some of some others that i could think of as well i think that, that's admirable as we look back on 
these great conductors of the past. I wonder, Neil, what lessons we can learn as contemporary musicians from the legacy that they've left. What I feel about all, all great conductors, but especially the, the ones we've been discussing today, it, it's the musical integrity. For all of them, the most important thing in their performance and in their lives was music. And I think that's really something we have to, you know, we, have, we, we can learn and, and something important to remember. And I would say for, with my teacher's head on, for young conductors, you know, people management is an important part of our job, but it's not everything. You know, the, 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 the musical content has to come first. I think it's just, Tim, I think it's just the mystery of it all. I don't know how it works. I mean, there are some, I watched Stokowski in one of those Arte films that they show on American television occasionally, a snippet. And I think it was, it, it was Ravel or Debussy, probably Ravel, I think. And it was like watching somebody playing with a theremin. Is it, is it, it's a theremin, I think, isn't it? Uh, it was all impressionistic. It was, and the orchestra did everything that was required of them. And you looked at him and thought, how on earth do they do that? I think I, I personally have been very lucky that a lot of conductors that I've worked with who have had reputations for um, throwing toys out of the pram in the past, by the time I've got to work with them, all my colleagues around me say he or she has mellowed. Oh, they've really mellowed, you know. Um, and I've been terribly lucky in this way. So I see people who've been on the, the other end of anger management courses or whatever. We, we've all had to learn, I think, in the last um, uh, decade or more that um, taking your temper into a workspace is not helpful. And, and I think in the last few years in particular, we've learned uh, that a bullying culture does no one any good. So some of these sort of old school conductors have had to learn to rein that in um, because they would be uh, taken to account for it otherwise. Uh, and and I, I, can only, I can only say from my point of view as a singer where my instrument's inside me and it's uh, it, the, the mojo aspect is so important to me. If I, if I feel I want to sing, I can really sing. If something is going to stop me, I can't do it at all. And if someone... It, for whatever reason, thinks the best way to get a performance out of me is to undermine me in some way, to break me down or to build me up, then I cannot do it. Um, uh, uh, so that's, I've been lucky that uh, I can't think of anybody who's ever tried that on me personally, sort of, um, um, but certainly not professionally recently. I've been very, very lucky with that. Uh, so, so again, conductors who invite me to do my best that's where i'm likely to do to do my best work i think it's a, a lot of this is easy far easier to say than to do i think what a young conductor needs is all the qualities that i i talk about when i talk about heiting when i talk about mccarris um it's knowledge it's humility it's preparation it's it's wisdom uh, and there are a lot of good young conductors. I think it's, it almost goes without saying that you gain wisdom as you get older. I, I mean, I didn't see that anyone can argue against that. I mean, there are a lot of old people who are stupid. There's no doubt about that too. There are a lot of young people who are stupid. There are a lot of stupid people. Um, but I think in conducting, the older you get, the better you get at it because you hear more music You've dealt with more people. You know what human nature is like. So, so thinking about whether there's hope for young conductors, I think there is. Um, I, I don't know of any conductors who start well and finish uh, not good. I think the only way for a conductor is up. Uh, you have to be open to all sorts of ideas and 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 the important thing is to read as well and not just books about music but books about literature and and go to the theater and go to the art gallery and read about uh, arts philosophy and, and read about anything and and so on and so forth and biography and all the rest of it 
um, anything outside music in a, in, a, in a way. But I think if one is open to that as a young conductor, having mastered, incidentally, the basic techniques, it's really, really important that the basic techniques are absolutely sorted out and clear and, and unmistakable. Um, and provided you understand what a difficult job being an orchestral player is, but at the same time saying, look, we're doing a job here and I'm the one that's got the job of making sure it works. Follow me. Thank you so much for joining us on this episode of The Grounded Conductor, this final episode. And it's been a great privilege to talk to all our guests today. Thanks to them and special thanks to Professor Neil Thompson in Brazil for joining us. Neil, thank you so much. Oh, thank you too. It was a pleasure. You know, I, I love any opportunity to talk about conducting. After all these years, it still fascinates me. I hope you've enjoyed this episode and the others in the series, and in fact, all hashtag at home with LMP videos, which have been fantastic and diverse and hopefully will continue. And I hope you'll continue supporting the London Mozart players and perhaps consider donating to the London Mozart players, particularly at this time. For now, thank you for watching and be well.